Okay, thanks for tuning into this virtual part of perception. Uh, my name is Jeff. I am the staff director of Ferndale Library and part of Ferndale Library's Art and Exhibition Committee. And we have an artist here for you today, Dr. Joseph Ferraro, who works in macro photography and makes a, I guess we'll say that uh, he takes a closer look at a very, very tiny world. He takes photographs of native pollinators and other invertebrates. And he is here to show off a number of works to, uh, to you while you're at home watching this video. We'll be talking about some of these pieces like this one behind me, which is where we'll start. Hello, <laughs> I'm Joseph Barrow, and I'm going to introduce our first piece. This is Polyctus Lugatus. Um, it's a fairly common native bee. And this one happens to be on a black eyed Susan. And it was photographed at the very first BioBlitz I participated in um, with Oakland University in their lab. And basically, what a BioBlitz is, it can be um, you go out and you photograph or take samples of as many insects. In this case, it happened to be native bees that we could a specific amount of time. So I was doing uh, photography another photographer and the lab was doing collections and they, in this case they were doing very limited collections so they weren't impacting the environment or the area that they were actually surveying with collections and they're it's a, it's a, like I said it's a native bee um, pretty common in Michigan in this area and they as you see it's like all covered in pollen like totally covered in pollen which makes it efficient pollinator because unlike a honeybee, which isn't native, um, or even our bumbles, which are native, um, they are wet pollinators where they mix the pollen with some nectar and then they, you know, pack it into the body pouches um, and pack it around that way. And they get some on their body as well, but all this free pollen, this like electrostatically charged um, hair scale, modified scales, it makes it a really efficient pollinator. And um, they're about probably about bee sized, um, fairly approachable as bees go, and they're not extremely skittish, but they're also very wary as well because you know they're a big thing. Um, so, I like this. I started macro probably like 2014, I think. I've kind of lost track a little bit, but it was like 2014, and I'm like, oh. My photography practices were changing, my art practices were changing, things in my life were kind of like all over the place. And when I had bought my first camera, my first like digital, you know, you know, DSLR, I had gotten a macro lens thinking like at the time, thinking like, oh, I'm going to get back into doing macro because I've done it, I, you know, I had done it like way many years ago on film. Sat dormant. Years and years and years. I used the 100 um, just as a regular like portrait lens and everything else, but never really doing any macro work. And then I went out into the yard and I photographed a few caterpillars, didn't know what they were. Um, those caterpillars were actually eastern black swallowtails. So I had photographed a caterpillar in the backyard um, and it was an eastern black swallowtail and realized I actually didn't really know what it was. It was on my funnel. Um, and the lighting, everything. I didn't know really anything about this. So I dove in. And there's all things I like to do in, you know, endeavor. I just kind of like dove in, kind of like kept working and experimenting. And then 2015, in the spring, I had like a little bit of a rig hobbled together. Um, I had found a twin. I decided I wanted to go with... Um, Twin Flash and doing all this research, I realized like, oh, I didn't want to be a tripod macro guy, you know, um, going out and, you know, early morning catching dew covered insects. Like that's totally not my, it's not my style. It wasn't my style. I'm reading this and I'm seeing the images and I like this more like fluid kind of just go and happen to find a uh, used uh, Twin Flash, did some modifications on it. And that was like the first of so many different mods trying to fuse the light and chase this light that I wanted to see, like I would see in my head. And it just, no, this is where we're at. It's like, it just kept going and going and going and going and going. And it's a rabbit hole of 
the smaller you see something and there's always something smaller. I photographed, you know, beetles with weevils, you know, on them, you know, that are probably like, you know, 50th of its size. You know, you see um, a little teeny wasp that may be only like, you know, two millimeters and it's covered in dozens of mites that are even smaller. And it's, you know, it's just smaller and smaller and smaller. And there's this like world unseen out there. Um, and that brings us to elasioblasm. And that's like a, a very large um, grouping of small like sweat bees, and they call them sweat bees because they do exactly just that. They like to like land on you. And I call it paying the rent because um, I take photographs of them. So they will um, sit and they'll like walk on you and they'll like, they'll drink your sweat because they want like the salts and the, and the minerals and the liquids off it. And they're, I mean, there's, these bees are, they're small. Um, they do have stingers. They wouldn't sting you um, just because they're solitary bees. So they're not gonna risk stinging you and then ending up, you know, being squished um, as well as your skin's too thick. And so their stinger couldn't even actually penetrate you. So this little Lazio, she's probably about, you know, three millimeters or so. Um, so she's wee, she's wee size. And this is on bee balm. And so the bee balm, you know, far, you know, is actually fairly, you know, small as well. And these are probably just because I photographed them early on and kind of like didn't even realize like these were around us and kind of fell in love with them. And so they're always like, they'll always be some of my favorite bees to photograph. And they're so small and you're so large that you can get right up on them because at any given time, I'm like, you know, my camera, you know, the, the, you know, the insect is like about this far from my face. So that's fairly, you know, intimate and up close, but I can get right up on them. And they're usually pretty chill unless you like really jostle the, the flower that they're on. So, Velocity This is Mel Sodis. And she is a sunflower specialist. And she, so she likes like composite flowers. And as you see, sometimes they call them also, um, I was, we were looking this up the other day on a shoot. Um, I think they call them the chap leg um, bees just because they have like the big furry like legs. And as you see, you know, as she's portrayed in here, um, she looks like she has on like 70s fur boots on that are just totally covered in pollen. And she is covered in pollen um, as well. And so she's like just booking around. They're a little bit hard for me to photograph because when they're in flowers, I notice a lot, especially the composite flowers. Um, they're just like in there, like kind of like burrowing through. And where, you know, the other bees you see, they're kind of like usually like stepping back a little bit. And, you know, they're smaller bees, so they have longer tongues to reach into the flowers where this is all like right in here. So she's got a long tongue. Um, but the most part, she's like crawling over this like composite flower with, you know, everything that she needs right in this like field. Um, so it's just kind of like walking across your buffet and eating at the same time, which may not be the best description, but I just made it up right now. So we're going to use it. Um, and they're fun. And I love finding them whenever I find like composite flowers, sunflower fields. If I see sunflower fields, I'll immediately stop because you'll see like the longhorn bees like the males like chilling out and sleeping. And then, you know, the females just crawling around. She's got beautiful eyes. Um, they're like this like blue green and it has that like um, um, interference pattern like on there. That's just so, so gorgeous. All right, this is Agoclora pura. It is a green sweat bee and they're awesome. So you, you might see them zipping around. People see them like the little metallic bees. They're mm, probably, if I get my millimeters right, probably about six, seven millimeters. So like, you know, a quarter inch, a little bit larger than that. Um, they're cavity nesters. This one was photographed on the same um, bio blitz as the Lyptus over there. And also on the Black Eyed Susan, which is like a fall, you know, happened to be like a fall pollen powerhouse. And they're beautiful. They have really good eyesight. They can be quite skittish, so you have to be very patient, persistent to get photos of them. Um, basically act like a giant bush that's not going to eat them. And um, 
you can't miss them when you see them out there. When you see these like little metallic like things zipping around. And there's other metallic bees as well that look similar that are not the Aquaclora, but um, she's, she's a favorite. And I'll always be happy when I find them like chilling in the backyard and I see them like nesting somewhat, and, you know, collecting pollen doing what they do. So you've heard me talking about going on a bio blitz. And a bio blitz, I was introduced to it, is sort of a survey. And you're trying to photograph as many of a subject that you're particularly out there to like survey in a given like amount of time or a day. And usually they're, from what I was, it was explained to me, is it's a, it's a limited amount of time that you're gonna do this like survey. So I went on this survey and it was a day pretty much of going to a couple different sites and photographing as many native bees as I could in a you know, set amount of time. And for me, it's like going up and getting close and doing more like my style, like photography. There was another photographer there that was doing more like setback work. Uh, the researchers, they were actually then doing a small collection sample where they were netting and capturing the bees to uh, like study them because sometimes you can only tell a different species by looking at them under a microscope because the similarities are that close. And so we have, I think it was like 4,500 um, native bees in like the United States and like North America. Um, Michigan has, I think now a total of, for the last count, it was close to 450, if my numbers are right. It was like 350 to 450, the numbers had kind of like inflated over a period of time. But those are native bees that are actually found in um, Michigan. So going on these bio blitzes are pretty important because you start doing, you start surveying the species that are around. And you can see what are in like large numbers or in small numbers or you can find something rare and they occur in different areas that you can start taking these samples. And it's a great way of non-destructively, like you're not harming the subjects when you're photographing them, um, as we do it very ethically. We don't ever want to harm our subjects um, to get a photo. And that's like another aside, is like the ethics of the, this photography and being a, a macro photographer in particular is do no harm. That's the thing. If you feel like you're stressing the subject out, you back off. If you happen upon a spider and it's feeding, you take a, a photo, you have to make sure that you don't knock that food um, it's prey from the spider's mouth because it might be the only food that like it, you know, it's going to find for a week. Um, and that's the difference of that, you know, it surviving and reproducing versus it not. So you have to be really respectful. And same thing with most of these bees are solitary bees, actually all of them are really just solitary. So you don't want to do them harm because there's no one else to care for the young or provide for them in their nesting chambers or tubes or wherever they're nesting the cavities if they're gone, if you cause them harm. This is not upside down, according to most of my friends. This is Megan Kiley. It is a leaf cutter bee. And this one was actually in my backyard on the swamp locally. And they are skittish. And those eyes are really, um, really sensitive. They can see really well. And it's about, you know, a yay big size um, bee. Very fast, they dart around. And um, they're beautiful because in the, the females, they carry their pollen not on the legs, but they actually carry the, the pollen on the underside of the abdomen. So you'll find these like subjects, like, and they're just like, their whole underside of the abdomen is just covered in pollen. And it's just absolutely beautiful um, looking. But, and I had joked about it not being upside down because they, particularly on this, on the milkweed, since the milkweed grows um, facing down a lot of times, the flowers droop, it actually will perch um, underneath to actually, just, there's no pollen in this for it, but this is a nectar, um, nectar rich source for anything that flies needs fuel and nectar is fuel. So the milkweed provides ample of it, nectar that is. And I think on the wall, I have a bombus around here somewhere. One second, let me go get it. So right here is the bombus. Bombus from patients. And as you can see, she's just what they would call like a wet collector, a wet pollen collector. 
So on her thigh right here, she'll take some nectar, mix it in with the pollen that she's collecting it, and then stash, you know, stash it right there on her thigh. Um, she has some pollen throughout the rest of her body and she will collect and she's a you know awesome pollinator. Also a good buzz pollinator too, like you like your tomatoes or anything else. Oh, and knows how to get that pollen out of there where they land on a flower and they vibrate their wings really fast in their body and they pretty much shake the pollen loose to collect it and we really good at And honeybees don't do that. Um, bubbles do. And bumblebees, pretty chill. Um, also very quick. You think like bubbles, when you see them in flight, they're always like, like you know, buzzing around. But when they're on a flower and they're collecting, they're pretty quick to be like, they move rather fast and they're rather fast in their collection and their feeding. So it makes photographing them at a close distance, or in the distance that I, I, I shoot, um, with, with a challenge, a fun challenge, but a challenge nonetheless. So right here, we have a Saratina that is in my yard feeding on the chives. And they absolutely love the chives in the springtime, as most people actually like the chives as well. And you can tell um, on her that there's like two different layers of pollen, like this like greenish uh, colored pollen from the chives themselves. And I believe the yellow um, pollen is from like the blanket flowers. So she was visiting a couple different flowers at the time. And they call the Saratinas uh, small carpenter bees because they like to use the pith inside of stems to line their cavities um, for their nests. And you can tell when you look at their mandibles, they're like flat, like little chisels, like for, you know, for stripping the, the pith out of the inside of the stems and such. And they're really, they're relatively common bee. They're sort of like metallic-ish um, green. They can be darker, almost like um, black in color as well. Again, probably about four, four millimeters or so. Um, I think I'm getting my sizes right. I'll just do this. It's about A size. Um, not overly skittish, but at the same time, not overly, um, when you approach them, they're going to like move away a little bit just because you're a large thing and you know, approaching on them. They want to make sure they don't get eaten. Um, but again, a relatively common, uh, common bee, great pollinator. If you want your cilantro, uh, pollinated to get coriander, you know, they're perfect for it. Um, cause they're so small. They actually can do, they do an excellent job. You see like the pollen on her, on her legs. They're great for pollinating um, all sorts of flowers as well as the chives. So all these prints behind me are printed on wood and I print them myself in my home studio and I build the structures at my other, my construction studio. And you can see each one is it's unique because each piece of Baltic birch that I use has its own unique grain pattern. So no two prints that I make, even of the same piece, will look um, identical. It was a fairly laborious process to figure out how to do it, how to do it in my own home studio, how to get the results that I wanted. And, you know, working on print for oh so many years, I have a particular vision in my head when I want to see something printed. So that had to match what I'm doing on the wood and not having the really the wood tone show through. Like you can see on the images, um, the tone doesn't show through, only the grain. And that was fairly important in my development process. And everything else is made um, by me as well. The, the frames, the backer. Um, so the whole piece is pretty much a custom. It's a custom design and custom piece. Um, and that brings us to the shot. What are you gonna see right now? You see a mason bee um, in one of the nesting tubes. And it is in one of two bee hotels that sit in my backyard. And I put them in quite a few years ago. In the first year, nothing. Um, second year, the second year in the spring, I did get something. 
and I had mason bees in the area that decided that the home that I was providing for them was a perfect place to start nesting. And so every spring I see them and I have, you know, some that are they'll overwinter from midsummer to the following spring. So next year, next spring, I will have some, you know, merge. And then after in the summer when the mason bees, you know, they basically are lying dormant till the following spring, the solitary wasps move in to the other open chambers. And the solitary wasps are actually quite beneficial for the yard because they control um, spiders, small, you know, small caterpillars, they'll eat aphids, um, and they're, again, they're solitary wasps, so they're pretty chill. Um, they're not really, they're not aggressive at all. And same thing with the mason bees. The mason bees aren't aggressive. They're really kind of gentle. Most of the time I'm photographing um, the, the hotel or trying to photograph the subject, um, like this female that's sitting inside the tube. When they fly out and they decide that I'm no longer a threat, a lot of times they actually bump into me when they're like trying to make their exit because I'm just now this like object in front of them and they're not, they're just like super chill and they're great to have around. And you can see in this, it was shot in the spring where some of these had merged from the previous year. And this is before that the rest of the, um, the tubes would then would get replaced. So then you, were, you cycle the tubes over every couple of years just to make sure that pathogens and such aren't kind of accumulating in there. They're a great thing to have. We feature in Joseph Ferrara's work throughout the month on our social media pages. The library has its own art and exhibition Facebook page, facebook.com slash F-A-D-L-A-R-T. We'll be releasing links soon for a chance to meet virtually with the artist for Q&A over Zoom. It'll be October 7th. Stay tuned.